Hey, good evening, everybody. This is Kevin Steinhauser working with you through Fiveable tonight on rhetorical analysis, effective conclusions. So we've been doing our second mini unit of the year on rhetorical analysis. We did analysis in the fall uh, for several weeks, and then the last three weeks we have been looking at rhetorical analysis, taking it to the next level as we are getting very close to our exam in May. So tonight we are wrapping that up by looking at conclusions really for the first time this year when it comes to rhetorical analysis. We had a couple people asking about that two weeks ago. So we'll do a deep dive in, in how to effectively end a very high level analysis essay. Now, keeping in mind that this is um, intentionally the end of our rhetorical analysis unit. So please make sure you feel very comfortable about what to do on an analysis essay and how to achieve really high scores. So the last couple of weeks we've looked at how to take our analysis to the next level by looking at what does the audience think and do or likely respond to the author's work. And then two weeks ago we talked about tracking an argument from beginning, middle to end. So make sure you have seen those two sessions. If you're a Fiveable Plus member, you can go back and check those out on replay. Tonight's will be a nice way to close out our rhetorical analysis mini unit. And then from here on out, the rest of the year, we will be doing um, just some review, really nothing new to teach at this point through our class, AP Lang. It's all about making sure we're at peak capacity and capability on May 15th, our test day. So again, it, it feels good to have nothing else to cover after tonight, but please come on back and make sure you're really feeling confident and you know you're going to do well on May 15th. You know exactly what you have to do. So between now and May 15th, it's all about deliberate practice. So practicing both timing and executing a high level skill. The more reps you get in on all components of our exam, the likelier uh, or the more likely you will do exactly how you want to do on test day. So I'm going to launch into my slides. As always, if there are any questions about anything you want me to cover, please let me know and I will get to them by the end. So you can use the ask a question um, button here if you're watching through our Fiveable uh, platform. So let me do that differently. All right, so today all about effective conclusions. I'm just making sure we're set up here. Next week, we will start our wrapping up series. So we'll make sure we hit everything again at a high level and also just at a review level. So next week will be a one-off lesson that hopefully will be very valuable. So I hope you can come back next week, April 16th. Precise language is all about um, how do I use not the fancy word, not an impressive word, just as an inherently impressive word, but the precise, perfect word to prove my point. So we'll do some practice rounds with that next week. Uh, and we'll talk about how they apply to all three essay types. So if you really want to take your essays to the next level, make sure you come to next week's, um, tune into next week's live session. If you want to take your six to a seven or your seven to an eight on that one to nine scale, this is a great way to do it. We also had um, kind of a parallel live session a few weeks ago on sentence structure. So writing style, sentence structure, and precise language are the two biggest pieces of writing style that over arc over all three essay types. How do, I, how do I become a better writer? Come back next week to really focus on that. But tonight, let's wrap up our rhetorical analysis review. So I always want to start thinking about the rhetorical triangle. So the first few slides here will be reviewed from the last two weeks. Um, so tune in and out depending on the week. So I want to make sure that we are always thinking about the most important parts. So the rhetorical triangle is subject, audience, audience, speaker, speaker, subject. What are the relationships between those three pieces of the rhetorical triangle? That's what I'm thinking about before I even read the work. So I would think, so always read the one or two sentences of context that College Board provides. And then say, okay, so what's the subject? What's the, who is the speaker? And what is the intended audience? Or who is the intended audience? And then what is the relationship between the three? I really want you thinking, maybe most importantly, about the relationship between the audience and the subject. 
So you have to use some inferencing here. You have to use some background knowledge here. But the more that you can think about this, the better the analytical task will go. So just thinking about what would the audience likely think about the subject before even reading the work. And that's where I want you starting. So that's what I really, when I talk about the rhetorical triangle, that's what I really want to emphasize or prioritize. What does the audience think about the subject before even reading the work? So in a nutshell, this is the rhetorical analysis task. Identify and explain what is effective about a particular argument. But you can't do that unless you know who the intended audience is. Because what's effective for someone in Russia might be different than someone in America. Likewise, what's effective for someone in 1920 might be different than what's effective in 2015. All right, so let's keep going with that in mind. I need to think about who the precise audience is, not just his audience or her audience, but who is the audience. That's who I'm grounding myself in, in terms of the analytical task. Again, in order to do this, you must do the following. Identify the primary purpose. So College Board will always give you, or generally speaking, they will give you the subject or a hint at the subject in the context. But they will rarely, if ever, tell you the primary purpose. So as you're reading, you must think, okay, what is the actual purpose, the primary purpose of this speech or excerpt or, or text? Second, identify the most important writing choices the writer makes. Two weeks ago, again, our live session, hopefully it was super valuable. Take a look at it if you missed it. Talked about taking that to the next level. How do I determine what's the most important. So I have to consider the audience. And then how to really track this, I recommend when possible, when you feel comfortable with it, how does the author begin and why? How does the author shift in the middle? What's the primary writing choice in the middle of the work? And then how and why does the author end how he or she ends? So that opens up doors to higher level analysis, which I did talk about a couple weeks ago. But again, when I'm talking about the audience, I'm talking about this is why the, the speaker would end with this exact writing technique, and this is how the audience would likely respond. This is how the audience would likely leave uh, the speech or, the, or leave reading the work because he or she ended it this way. All right, and then lastly, consider how these writing choices would impact the intended audience. These are obviously super hand-in-hand. -hand. I can't inherently... Choose the best writing strategies without a consideration of audience. All right, so the audience subject side of the rhetorical triangle, let's emphasize that as I started to tonight. What does the audience likely believe about the subject before reading the work? And then I'm adding this here. How does the author carefully consider the audience's projected beliefs in order to do one of two things? And maybe a combo of these two. So the author could be reinforcing a coexisting belief or changing the audience's mindset. And a lot of times you will see that combo. Maybe, and again, think about the beginning, middle, and end. Maybe the beginning of the work, the speaker is reinforcing a belief and aligning him or herself with the audience. And then by the end, the speaker is challenging the audience to do something differently or to believe something differently. So think about that. But think about... Um, Higher level analysis would be why start where the speaker starts, shift where the speaker shifts, and then end where the speaker ends with the specific intended audience in mind. All right, and in case you did not um, tune in the last two weeks, I wanted to make sure you saw a potential writing plan. If I was to write this essay, this would be my plan, most likely. So 12 minutes. When you're doing a rhetorical analysis essay, don't skip this part. This is what makes or breaks your essay. What The quality of your writing, so what you write, hinges on a high-level reading of the text. So annotate, read, identify the purpose, identify the primary writing strategies that are impactful to the audience. Once you do that, and again, 12 minutes to do that um, actually is a difficult task. So 12 of the best minutes of exam day right here. Shift then to six minutes of an intro. You could cut that down a little bit. I did a, I did a live session on an effective intro back in the fall. So if you're a Fiveable Plus member, you can check that slide out or that session out, I should say, if you happen to miss it. 
Same with body paragraphs. I did a live session with uh, body paragraphs of rhetorical analysis in the fall. Make sure you check that out. That's probably the most important live session of all rhetorical analysis because this is where you earn your scores. This is where I'm spending the majority of my time. 18 minutes to write two or three body paragraphs. And I always recommend to my students, less is more in terms of the number of paragraphs because more is more when it comes to the detailing length of your explanation. So we'll, um, again, I check that out with the fall live session on body paragraphs, but tonight we'll talk about conclusions. Now I'm keeping this totally in perspective. This is a common question, how do I wrap up? It's a valid question, it's one of your four or five paragraphs, but out of your four or five paragraphs, it's the least important one and let's be very clear on it. That's why I'm spending only two minutes on it. And then I also recommend always spend two minutes or so to proofread and revise. So let's say you're going in order. And remember, you can go in any order of your choosing. But let's say you go in order of synthesis and then analysis and then argument. So let's say this is your very middle um, essay. I recommend executing whatever your timing plan is. Maybe write out yours. Maybe map out yours. Maybe you can do this in 10 minutes and you feel confident. Again, don't rush it. But if you always tend to end early and confidently, you've got a couple minutes somewhere. Maybe you know you need 20 minutes here, so you have to shave off a couple minutes of your intro. So make the plan that you need to make. With that said, I do recommend spending time with the conclusion, and we'll unpack my reasons why throughout the night. But before you move on to your third and final essay, if this is your second essay, take two minutes to proofread and revise. I don't want you to write three essays and then take three minutes at the end to, to act like you're actually proofreading and revising. Uh, I'm not saying that you can't, but you will proofread and revise at a higher level if it's fresh, as long as you have the capability to say, okay, put aside what I think I said, let me actually look at the words on the page. So when I talk about proofreading and revising, it's really important that you have that skill. A lot of students that I come in contact with every year, even if they reread their words, they're still in their head, so they know what they meant to say. So they might have skipped a word and not even catch that error on their proofreading round. So again, act like you're reading someone else's words. Read through it quickly and efficiently, but critically. Look for mistakes. If you proofread and revise, and if you don't make any changes, I would caution, I would caution you to say maybe you're going through the motions. So don't be overconfident. Look at it really critically. I guarantee you, you made some small errors in a 38 minute timed writing. If, if 38 of your minutes is the, is the writing piece in the last two year proofreading. I would, because 38 minutes of a high stakes environment, you're likely going to make mistakes. So take those two minutes to proofread and revise. But let's talk about conclusions. Um, we'll unpack that the rest of the night. Again, two minutes is all I'm asking for. So we're going to talk about timing and the tension of timing tonight on here's the ideal conclusion, but what do I do if I honestly can't pull that off in two minutes? So we'll talk about that tonight. Let's jump into components of effective writing. I'm just popping in and making sure we're still good to go. Again, if you have any questions as I go now that we're in the, the nitty gritty of effective conclusions, and if I'm going too fast and if, if I'm not clear on anything, please let me know. Uh, please be engaged and interactive so we can make sure everyone's leaving tonight feeling confident about how to write a conclusion. And then it's about, like I said at the beginning, doing some reps, making sure you've done this a few times before exam day. So I recommend four to six sentences. And the reality is it's probably going to be closer to four because you've got two minutes. So Let's talk about the two things that I want this uh, conclusion to do or that I recommend that the conclusion does. But then let's also talk about, uh, let's start to talk about the timing tension. So the first thing you do in an effective conclusion is briefly revisit the occasion, the audience, and the purpose of the work. I'll show you a model conclusion here in a moment so you can see how this looks in action. The second thing you do in an effective conclusion is emphasize the impact that the work may have had on the audience. Now you don't want to start to sound, especially in this first component, you don't want to start to sound robotic. You don't want to start to sound formulaic. So you don't want to say the occasion of the work was blank. The audience was blank. The purpose was blank. So you're just going to weave this information in, in a natural way. And absolutely that does take practice. 
and I'll show you my model here in a moment. But the most important component is this latter one. Emphasize the impact that the work may have had on the audience. I'll be honest, a lot of people who do write conclusions do this first step, but not as many students do this second step. So I've been an AP reader for several years. Um, I've read rhetorical analysis a couple of those years. And I would say most students do not have an effective conclusion. Most students do have a very short conclusion, maybe even less than four sentences. And that's okay, to be honest. You're not make or breaking your score in the conclusion. You're securing your score in the conclusion. So I'll talk about, again, in a few slides, why I recommend having a conclusion. But I'll say it now this way. You're securing your score. So as we are reading any type of essay, College Board trains us to say, okay, grade holistically and actively as you're reading. So you're reading the intro. And as you're reading the intro, you're thinking, okay, this is an upper half essay, a middle essay, or a lower half essay. And then you're, you're starting to pinpoint the score every sentence or every paragraph as you read. So by the end, I already have an idea, okay, this is either a four or a five. Okay, this is either a six or a seven. The conclusion can bump you up to the seven or it can hold you down to the six. Not having a conclusion, to be honest, is not going to move you from a high six to a five. It's just not going to allow you for, to go from a high six to a low seven. So I hope that that's clear. Uh, conclusions are not mandatory. There, there's not an automatic point for having a conclusion. I know for some AP exams, like uh, they give points for doing certain tests. That's not how we work. We were, ho we're holistic. And I like it that way because that's more of like a real world, uh, like a college level English 101 type of grading in a lot of universities. So you're graded holistically. Again, conclusions are not mandatory, but on the rubric for every essay, it does say, for synthesis, analysis, argument, it does say provides a sense of closure or has like a holistic organizational pattern or some sort of language like that. So a conclusion is certainly um, cluing in you and the reader that you've organized your thoughts and now you're wrapping them up. So it's a sign of effective writing. So if you can have an effective conclusion, absolutely have an effective conclusion with one caution. Don't take more than a couple minutes on it. So spend your time on body paragraphs if you're fighting for that six, right? And still have a quick conclusion, but don't stress about a quick conclusion until you're writing sixes consistently or higher. Because once you're writing sixes, sixes consistently, like I said, conclusions can help you bump to the next level, but it's not going to save you. If you're writing a four, the best conclusion in the world is not going to get you to a six. It's all about what you do in the body paragraphs at that point. So I, I started talking about this. Do not simply restate the occasion, audience, and purpose. Don't sound formulaic. Don't just say the occasion was blank. The audience was blank. All right. Weave this information in as I just stated. I get a lot of questions as I, as I talk to students about, okay, how are conclusions different than introductions? Well, before we go further, let's just go back. So in the intro, I talk about the occasion and audience and purpose of the work, and I talk about the audience, which is what this does. So yeah, there is a similarity between intros and conclusions. Both an intro and a conclusion of a rhetorical analysis essay address those things, occasion, audience, purpose. Totally agree with you, if that's what you were thinking. But here's a key difference. Introductions focus on your own context, what you could bring to the table. And again, see my intro um, live session from the fall for a deep dive into this. They're, they're basically doing this. What does the audience likely believe about the subject before reading the author's work? So again, on the rhetorical triangle, that audience subject side. That's what the rhetorical analysis introduction is focusing on. And you're bringing your own inference and background knowledge to the table there. You're not just repeating what College Board's providing in that one or two sentence of context. You're going way beyond that with your own background knowledge. Here's what conclusions do. Conclusions highlight what you have already thoroughly unpacked in your essay. So you're going much further than your intro did uh, throughout your essay, obviously. Now you're hitting, let's go back. Just to make this really clear, you're hitting this part way more in your conclusion. So you're touching on this briefly. You already touched on it in the intro. Now you're really emphasizing here. How would the audience uh, respond to the work? 
So again, is it one or a combo of these? Is the author reinforcing a belief in the audience? Or is the author intending to change the audience's mindset? That's what I want you talking about. How would the audience leave the speech? Now, don't talk in absolutes, quick side note, because you weren't there, or I shouldn't say that, maybe you were. <laughs> Most likely, you weren't at the speech, right? Or you, you weren't the intended primary audience for the majority of works that we'll, we'll, that we'll analyze. However, even if you know a lot about those audience members, even if like you know a ton about those audience members, you don't know every single person in the audience. So you can never assume everyone in the audience left thinking X or everyone in the audience left reinforced uh, this belief in their heads. But you can use phrases like the audience likely would have believed blank or likely would have been stirred to do blank. So don't talk in absolutes, uh, but absolutely use inferences. How do you think the audience would respond? Talk about the target audience. That's what's going to separate you from the average rhetorical analyzer. Most people um, who I read, most essays that I read, are talking about the author only. This is what the author does. This is how it's effective. How do you know if it's effective unless you're talking deliberately about the intended audience? So that's where I'm pushing you all to, to really focus on. It's all about the audience. All right, so then we're providing a sense of closure. This is the conclusion. If your essay just stops and the reader says, oh, did he run out of time or did she run out of time or not? Like, is this how he wanted to end? That's a problem. So you want to make sure your reader knows, oh, you ended exactly how you wanted to end. There's two options here. Let's unpack them. So option one, um, to provide a sense of closure, you're going to discuss what the audience would likely, again, don't talk in absolutes, would likely believe after reading or listening to the author's work. Here's an example. Let's say this is Martin Luther King's, uh, one of his speeches. After listening to King's speech, the audience, both black and white, would likely be motivated to work harder than ever before to fight for racial equality. Great last sentence. So just something wrapping up my entire two or three body paragraphs, my four or five uh, paragraph essay. In one sentence, let's end this by talking about how the audience would likely leave in like one quick sentence. Or option two. Now, option two is the higher level option, but it's not always going to work. So you really have to be able to, to realize, okay, does this work for this specific excerpt or speech? Can I pull this off or not? So let's talk about it, but let me caution you against it uh, just to be like healthily pro like process this in a healthy way. So if appropriate, option two is to contextualize the work beyond the year it was produced. Caution. So caution one, this will only work for some subjects or works, like I just said. And option, or I'm sorry, caution two, be careful not to stray from the topic. Don't do this step unless you are confident you can pull it off. So maybe try it a couple times in class, get feedback from your teacher and see, hey, is this perfect? Is this in that sweet spot of I'm contextualizing it, but I'm not straying too far from the topic? And when in doubt, let me be very clear here, stay safe with option one. This is a great end to, it, to an essay, and this is a more traditional end. But I wanted to, to let you know I always am coming from the place of not what I think, um, but what do I see in both my classroom and when I meet other students, because I do some teaching uh, or tutoring from other AP language students personally, um, and also what I see at the AP reading every year. So this is the most common option for sure that's effective option one discuss what the audience would likely believe after reading the work but option two honestly i've seen it done in higher level papers and i haven't seen it done um like poorly very often and it's because i think people are being smart when in doubt stay with option one so in general i only see this done well but it's very rare um, but I, I shouldn't say it's very rare um, but it's it's in less than 20% of the, the essays. So it's pretty rare. Uh, it's definitely not the preferred or the common method. But I often see, I don't see this done poorly, like I said. Now, when I show this to my students and we practice it, sometimes they, they're done poorly. But like by May 15th, um, 
we've hashed out, no, that's too far, rein it back in. Just stick with option one, it's safer, et cetera, et cetera. So by May 15th, students who are pulling off contextualization are doing it well. But again, it's rare. So just keeping that in mind, and I'll show you an example of that, um, of how that would look. So this is the same speech. Decades after, this is the contextualization, decades after Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, it is clear that this monumental day in American history has had a lasting impact on race relations in the country. Now, I'm not taking a ton of time in my conclusion to provide this, but this would be a good, awesome last sentence of a conclusion paragraph. Now, the reason why this is safe, let's go back to my cautions. It did work here because um, his work in the 60s, we have the benefit of hindsight. So we have the benefit of seeing how that work has become impactful and how it actually helps to create change. I didn't stray from the topic because the topic of his speech is race relations. So again, I'm not letting this blow up my analysis. This is the only time I would talk about this. This is the only time I would contextualize Martin Luther King's speech or whatever the speech is, like to today's um, like date or to today's society. I would not do this in my body paragraphs. I would stick to the intended audience. But if I know this was a seminal work on whatever topic, and it had, has, has had a lasting legacy. This is a great way, and a very powerful way, to impact and to close my essay. So I'm gonna read our sample. Just checking. I'm going to read our sample rhetorical analysis conclusion paragraph, and then we'll break down why it's effective. Honestly, pretty by the book, but pretty lengthy. So again, once we're done breaking this one down, and this is a great conclusion. Once we'll do that, though, um, we'll talk about, okay, what do I do if I can't pull this off in two minutes? Because the reality is this, there's a lot of words on this page. So, so, so let me make that very, very clear. Um, I want to be able to pull this off in two minutes. I'm writing as fast as I can. Again, that's why it's important to go back and proofread because you're writing super fast. But I'm not thinking while I'm concluding. I've already done the heavy lifting. I already know what I'm going to say before I write the first word of my conclusion. So I can't write a sentence and then sit there and think. And then write a sentence and sit there and think. I've got to know what I'm going to have. And then it's all about executing as fast as I can in those couple minutes. All right, so let's say um, I was able to pull it off. Let's look at kind of the bar. Let's look at a high level. Um, conclusion paragraph. And again, let's be clear, most students are not earning sevens, eights, and nines on rhetorical analysis. The average score the last seven years has been between like a 4.1 and a 4.7. So in that full range, five is, is tracking for a qualifying score of a three or higher. So keeping that in mind, we want to be better than average. So let's look at this is the bar and then we work our way up to meet it. I'll just read it all through. This is um, on Reagan's challenger address. If you're, if you're with me way back in the fall when we were working through rhetorical analysis, we actually talked about the challenger address at length. So that's why I pulled it back um, for tonight. So on the evening of one of the most tragic events in American history, President Reagan offered exactly what his nation needed. Knowing that the nation is at the very beginning of the mourning process, Reagan authentically joins them in mourning. Once he gives his audience permission to mourn alongside him and to continue mourning upon the completion of his national address, he boldly challenges them to support space exploration in the coming years, even in the face of potential disaster. Although evolving technology has minimized the need to frequently send astronauts into space, the continued funding and support of American space exploration continues to this day. This is where I start to contextualize. Decades after Reagan's address to the nation, it is clear that his gentle nudging of the American people had a lasting impact. So let's just count them. One, two, three, four, five sentences. So I said four to six. These are long sentences. I totally agree. If you're thinking that, this is long. This is a high bar to try to reach, to do this in just a few minutes. 
Now, again, you make your own plan. Maybe you, maybe you feel confident taking three or even four minutes to write a conclusion. I never recommend more than four minutes, though. I think two to three minutes is that sweet spot. Spend as much time as you can in your body paragraphs. And just to make a clear last word on timing tonight, use absolutely every minute. Now, if you're on Fiveable uh, and going above and beyond really prepping for this test, I'm assuming you already knew that and were already planning on it. But I just want to make sure not just that you're using every minute, but that you have the best plan for you on how to maximize those minutes. All right, so let's break down the components here. I'm, I'm just going to run through, and I've highlighted on these slides what um, aligns to the heading. So the occasion, this is how I slip it in or weave it in. It's not the occasion is blank. Or Ronald Reagan said this speech when. This is actually just part of my first sentence on the evening of one of the most tragic events in American history. Now, when I read that paragraph, I hope it wasn't obvious to you like, oh, he's trying, he's forcing in the occasion, purpose, uh, and audience. I hope it sounded like a natural flow because that's what the point of this is. So that's what the point of effective writing is. It sounds natural. Every sentence builds upon the next. Audience, it's in the second sentence. The nation is at the very beginning of the morning process. I've said American up here, so it's an American audience. Purpose, make sure we do hit it. Uh, once It's a dual purpose in the challenger address. Once he gives his audience permission to mourn alongside him and to continue mourning upon the completion of his national address, he boldly challenges them to support space exploration in the coming years, even in the face of potential disaster. Twofold, so mourning and then supporting space exploration. Very clear there. If anything, make that more clear. Like, again, err on the side of clarity when it comes to your purpose. And then provide closure. I went with option two here to show you the higher level option. Option one, how would the audience likely leave? So let's just talk about what that might look like. The, so don't look at the slide, just like listen. Um, the audience would likely still be in mourning. Right? So you, you have maybe a sentence on that. But the audience would also be reassured and likely to continue space exploration after hearing this commander urging from their president, whom, let's be honest, they respect. Now, is the, is the country divided politically? Of course. But this was a day of coming together as a country, and I would have unpacked that in my body paragraph. So with that in mind, let's look at option two now. So you can look back at the slide, what's in red. Although, although evolving technology has minimized the need. So really, I have two sentences here of contextualization. So one or two, but that's a great way to end if you can pull it off and if it works. So again, if this was a 2015 speech, we probably wouldn't have much context we could provide because we're not that far away from it. But since this was, this was in the 80s, we can look back and say, okay, um, space exploration does continue to today. Now, it looks different, so I could talk about that too. Um, but this seems to be a, a great closure because, again, Reagan said mourn, but also don't um, stop our commitment to space exploration. So decades after Reagan's address to the nation, it's clear that his gentle nudging of the American people has had a lasting impact. So I said I would talk about it. Let's just be very clear tonight to conclude or not to conclude. A lot of teachers that I meet say don't conclude, don't waste your time, and I 90% agree with them actually. Don't waste your time. Don't take more than two to four minutes here. But again, if we're shooting for more than a six, we absolutely need a conclusion. We, we absolutely want to provide that holistic experience, that sense of high level organization. Here's the benefit. So one, um, an effective conclusion provides a sense of closure. It's a sign of a high-level writer. Two, effective conclusions improve the overall organization. So I hope I'm just being very clear here when I'm repeating that. And then lastly, they just allow you to recap the most important pieces, occasion, audience, purpose. By that repetition, and, and again, college writers are not going back and copying and pasting their intro. That's absolutely not what we're doing. So I'm, I'm weaving in the same type of info, but I'm doing it in more – Conclude the way. Um, so let's just go back to um, my paragraph. Let's look at the first two sentences because that's where that occasion um, 
audience comes in. On the evening of one of the most tragic events in American history, President Reagan offered exactly what his nation needed. That, is, that sounds very different than what my intro would have done when I'm providing my own context and I'm talking about what the audience would be thinking. So my intro, I would talk more about um, this is what the American public had experienced that day. This is how much they valued astronauts. This is how much, before even listening to Reagan, they were in mourning and shock. That's what my intro would say. Now here, I'm cutting to the chase, but I also am reminding my reader, this is what's happening. I'm prioritizing occasion, occasion, audience, and purpose by repeating it in those privileged positions of intro and conclusion. So those are the three reasons why I highly recommend a quick but efficient conclusion, and you only can be efficient and effective through repetition, so repeated effective practice. Now, let's end tonight by talking about the reality of, again, that timing tension. What if I can't pull this off? in two minutes. So what I did here is I typed up a relatively effective one sentence conclusion from 2015. So I'd say here, and this is a sample essay, and the sample essay um, had a qualifying score, um, I, if I remember correctly, a six. So this can certainly get the job done in even one sentence. Let's look at it, let's discuss. I've shown you the highest bar possible, right? And, and I'm not saying that's the best conclusion paragraph you'll ever read, but like that's what that is what to shoot for in a very quick time setting that I'm recommending. All right, so let's read uh, this re real world example from a student in 2015. This is C Cesar Chavez. Um, that's the prompt we're looking at where he talks about the values of nonviolence. Chavez not only uses powerful contrast and moving diction to portray his cause favorably, but also cleverly appeals to his audience's sense of decency and religion to leave them with the idea that nonviolence is the only true, truly successful and moral way to achieve their goals. So I don't know if this writer was formally trained on writing conclusions or not, but he or she is doing some things very naturally. And clearly this is, uh, it sounds like a wrap up because it's just hitting the highlights of the essay. Now you don't have to, in your conclusion, repeat the writing choices. In fact, that's not part of what I recommend. Look at the bigger picture. How would the audience leave the work? That and, and what, again, what's the occasion audience purpose? But let's look. Um, this student has the audience because I mean implicitly in here, the audience is a primarily religious audience. So he has that or she has that. And then also purpose. Nonviolence is the only truly successful and moral way to achieve their goals. So in a, in a very quick and efficient way, we're checking some boxes. This is not. Let's be honest helping this student score, but it's also not hurting this student score. So it's just saying, yeah, I got a conclusion. I recommend doing this as opposed to leaving one off, but I hope tonight I've shown you how to do even better. So you, basically you, you get as close to my bar as you can in your two to four minutes. Well, let's see if there's any questions when we're done, but let's do some final reminders. So a quick live session tonight. Um, Conclusions, like I said, we take less time to unpack than, let's say, a body paragraph or even an intro. But let's do some final reminders. And again, next week, we'll be doing precise writing style. No matter how good of a writer you are, that is a great opportunity to really flex those muscles as a writer. All right, so final reminders tonight. Conclusions can improve the overall quality of your paper. But again, don't take more than a couple minutes on them. Second, rehash this info. Occasion, audience, purpose. And then finally, <laughs> provide a sense of closure to your family. That was a Freudian slip. It should be to your reader. I don't know why I said family. I must have been thinking about my family when I put that slide together. All right, provide a sense of closure to your reader or to your audience. All right, let's wrap up tonight. I appreciate you all being with me um, through this rhetorical analysis three-week review. So rhetorical analysis is always the most frequently um, asked questions that I receive as an AP language teacher. Student, it's just so different than synthesis and argument. So I appreciate you really going all in. These live sessions, you can always go back and review if you're a 500 plus member. Hey, and if, if not, either way, I will see you all hopefully back here next Tuesday and we'll be working on writing style. All right, everyone, have a great week and I will see you then.